All right, so again, this is being recorded. Um, so let's start with ACT psychology. So when we talk about ACT psychology uh, and Franz Brentano, we're looking at the precursor to several disciplines, uh, Gestalt and humanistic psychology. So uh, it really moves us towards direct observation, but this subjective experience of direct observation. So the major player when we think of ACT psychology is Franz Brentano. Some of his students uh, were Stumpf, von Ehrenfels, and Freud. Um, we're going to talk about Stumpf today. And in terms of his major accomplishments, uh, he wrote psychology from an empirical standpoint. And while he shared the same vision that Wundt shared to turn psychology into a science, he disagreed on how to measure psychology. So he did, he was, if you read this manuscript, he was dire directly opposed to the concept of introspection. He also was more empirical, and by empirical, I mean observational, took, took direct observation from experience versus Wundt, which you learned in the last lecture, was more about uh, sensation perception, but through uh, experimentation careful experimentation. So if I were to say, well, what's the divide? One focuses on manipulation of, of a data point and allowing you to introspect on that. Uh, the other focuses on your experience as the experience, as the observing person. So uh, Brentano is gonna focus more on the content pardon me, Brentano is going to focus more on the process, whereas uh, Vunt is going to focus more on the content. So as I said, ACT psychology, it focuses on the mental activity or what the mind does as a function or as opposed to what Vunt focused on, which was the mental content or the structure of the mind. Now, you may recall in a previous lecture, I also mentioned the term structuralism, right? So structuralism is part of um, the legacy of Wundt and Titchener. Now, granted, uh, Wundt, we describe his approach as volunteerism, but he was still a structuralist uh, in principle. So act psychology, we focus on the process of seeing rather than what is seen. And the classic example he gives is if you were to show something, are you focused on the color or are you focused on the process of seeing color, if that makes sense. So if you were Vunt, you would focus on color as a conscious experience that is built up. Whereas if you were Brentano, you would focus on the process of seeing that sensory or perceptual experience, right? So uh, if Brentano were to say, well, what is my focus? He would say, my focus is on the mental activity, not the product, right? So the mental activity. So if you're going to do act psychology, you're going to need different approaches. You're, you're not going to be able to use introspection and that experimentation that he used. Rather, you're going to need to use uh, strategic observation strategies. And a couple of the observation strategies he used were memory and imagination, right? So uh, but still we're focusing on the process. So uh, the process of remembering, right? The process of imagining and describing your experience as you're remembering or as you're imagining. So that's act psychology. 
So one of Brancano's students name was Carl Stumpf. And Stumpf was a musician. He studied under Brancano, as I said, and he becomes the major rival of Wundt. And there was an antagonistic relationship there. So in terms of his research, he focuses on audition or hearing. So he focused on the psychology of tone. And you may remember uh, von Helmholtz in his, his theory of audition or hearing. So relative to their work, Stumpf is only second to Helmholtz in his contributions to acoustics. And uh, obviously he was uh, a major pioneer in the psychological study of music, right? Which is, that's unique, right? So if you were to think of, well, what is my career path? What could I study? Well, the psychological process or experience of music was one of his areas. Now, he believed in a principle called phenomenology. Now, I, I want to make it clear that phenomenology is both a philosophical and psychological phenomenon. And what it means is we examine the subjective experience of the individual, right? So, but it has to occur as it's occur, or, or our data collection, our observation has to occur in real time, if that makes sense. So phenomenologists, we wanna know, tell me what you're experiencing now versus an introspection, uh, which is looking backwards to what you've experienced in the past. Now, in therapy, phenomenology has a whole nother application. So if you were to do couples therapy and a couple gets in the middle of an argument and one person says, this is what happened. And then the second person says, no, 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 that's not what happened. This is what happened. How is it possible that you can argue over an experience. How is it possible that you could argue over what actually happened? Well, our experience is subjective in nature. And that subjective experience is our reality. Maybe not the objective truth, but it is our reality or our lived experience, if that makes sense. So that is phenomenology. So what did you experience? What did you experience? And the goal is to, you know, not reject or argue what someone experienced or what was said, but try and better understand what their experience was at that moment. So that's phenomenology. Subjective reality is that person's reality and it is valid in nature. So that's uh, one angle. Now, Stumpf and Wundt disagreed in terms of how to understand a sensory experience such as hearing. So uh, Wundt felt that you could do introspection of tones, whereas Stumpf, Stumpf said, no, you have to use a phenomenological experience. And uh, who is going to be a more reliable source? Wundt said, well, I train my lab observers 10,000 trials before I even trust one data point. So they're well-trained, well-researched individuals. So they're, they're reliable. So there's going to be more consistency there. Stumpf said, that's great that you train them, but you train them artificially. If I'm going to talk about music and tone, I'm going to trust expert musicians more because their lived experience is such that they're always listening to tones. They have the nuance of music that your even highly trained lab observers do not have. So this fight led to Stump saying, I cannot accept any data from your lab. So this will not be the only time uh, 
you see two uh, contemporaries arguing over a, an idea and taking it to the level of rejecting the other's point of view. But as you can see, I said there was an antagonistic relationship to the point that Stumpf wanted nothing to do with the data from Funt's lab. So we also have uh, his own theory of emotions. So Stumpf felt that all emotions can be reduced to feelings uh, of sensations. Um, but here's an example of a sensation, a tickle or an itch or skin-based pain these triggers can induce some kind of emotional output. So let's say uh, itching might induce the emotion of frustration, right? Uh, pain might, cutaneous pain might uh, trigger anger, things like that. So, but it goes back to some sensation that you experience. And there are different arguments as to theories of emotion. And if you look at the more contemporary cognitive theories, uh, they incorporate some of what Stumpf was talking about. Now, other things that Stumpf did, he founded the Berlin Association of Child Psychology. So at the cutting edge of trying to understand the development or developmental course from children to adults. Uh, he also, uh, collected musical instruments and, and musical products as a whole. And he created a center for world's primitive music, whatever that means. Now, Colpi. Colpi was a student and then eventually a colleague of Wundt. He wrote uh, the outline of psychology and similar to what we've been saying from Brentano forward, he focuses on the experience. And the experience is dependent on an experiencing person. So the experiencing person is the focus. Uh, and it is subjective in nature, right? But how we understand what's going on in the world requires us to tap into the experience of other people. He establishes uh, a Wurzburg laboratory. And uh, some of his students include Angel, and we're going to learn all about him in lecture, I want to say eight, if I remember correctly. Uh, so we're going to learn all about him as well. But you can see the influence. And I said to you that Wundt, his monopoly on the idea of psychology as a science was very short lived. If you think of people like Ebbinghaus and Brentano and Stumpf and Kolpe, all of these individuals say, no, your introspection method is not right. It's not the correct way to collect data. Now, today we say uh, it's not entirely incorrect. It is a valid source the same way phenomenology is. But at that point, there was an argument as to what the psychological science was. So um, in terms of Kolpe, he thought that you could study thought processes in an experimental way. And uh, in terms of his approach being Kolpe, he used something called systematic experimental introspection. So what, it, what he did was he asked a person to perform a complex task and then um, after the task was done, he did a postmortem. He said, give me your retrospection, your report of the cognitive process experiences you experienced. So when you were doing this complex task, let's say uh, stacking a tower of 100 cups, not one of his tasks, but I'm throwing it out there. Stacking 100 cups. What was going through your mind at that time? So what Colpe felt was that you could access how you process that information before. Now, uh, Wundt did not agree because remember his sensation and perception studies 
the introspection was happening in real time. So he didn't think Colby's idea of uh, looking backwards uh, was a good one. He referred to it as mock introspection. And mock is like fake or pseudo introspection. It isn't real introspection. So when it came to Colby, Colby took very detailed summaries of what his respondents or subjects told him. And he focused on their subjective qualitative experience. Now, you remember earlier, Wundt said that he wanted a quantifiable objective data point. He was more influenced by the German physiologists and precision mattered. Whereas this qualitative experience, he felt that you weren't getting as much uh, preci uh, precision. Okay, so what was Colby's goal? His goal was to try and understand what's going on while you're having a conscious experience, what's going on in the mind. Uh, and this is a great idea. And even if we were to think about neuroscience, we have fMRIs and we have PET scans and things like that, where we're trying to see how the brain works while doing a task. So there, the idea of trying to understand what's going on in the mind while you're having a conscious experience was not a bad one. So what were some of the differences between Kolpe and Wundt? Uh, well, the experimenter played a very little or minimal role in the data collection or your results, right? Keep in mind, Wundt, all he did was present a stimulus and record what your observations were. Whereas Kolpe, Kolpe would ask specific questions to elicit reactions. So he's having a much more direct influence over your responses. And in clinical interviewing, we know that the responses you get can sometimes be based on the way you phrase a question or the questions you ask or the questions you fail to ask, right? So Colby, um, you know, this is a, an issue here for Vunt because maybe you're asking leading questions. Maybe you didn't ask the right questions. And because you had such an influence over the reaction of the participants, he, he had questions about Colby's data. Now, what's the goal? Well, Colby's goal was to try and understand cognition, try and understand higher mental processes uh, in a time where we didn't fully understand cognitive psychology. He also wanted to refine the method of introspection so his version of introspection is very different than Wundt's version of introspection. Now, here's an interesting thing. He also introduced a term or a concept called imageless thought. So the idea that you can close your eyes and conjure up an image without actually seeing it that's imageless thought, right? So if I were to um, put you in a dark room, right? There's no light or dark chamber. And I ask you to think about the color red. You could actually conjure up the color red in your mind. And uh, the idea, Colby said is, you don't need a direct stimulus to be able to process an image. And uh, that was big, right? Because again, this is going to influence later cognitive psychologists. Um, and you, there is clearly some angle or aspect of consciousness that is not sensory in nature. Now, was he the only person who believed this? No. Robert Sessions Woodworth and Alfred Binet, when we talk about cognitive psychology and Binet in, in terms of the uh, mental testing movement, 
uh, they also believed in the concept of imageless thought. So as this laboratory is developing, there are some major uh, players. So Karl Marb talked about the idea that sensations and images have no part in the process of judgment of weights. Now, if you remember what we talked about the just noticeable difference, right? If I blindfold you, you should be able to determine the difference between 40 pounds and 41 pounds. Because if you remember the just noticeable difference was one out of 40, right? So if there's uh, one fortieth of a difference, you should be able to detect that. So Karl Marb said, hey, yeah, you can use visual cues, but they're unnecessary to detect the difference in uh, judgments and weights. Henry Watt, Henry Watt used uh, the word association test, right? So he would say a word and ask you to say whatever came to mind. And this idea is very similar to Freudian free association, right? Uh, the idea that you could tap into mental processes that are occurring beneath the surface, right? So um, it wasn't just what you were experiencing in that moment. It, weren't, it wasn't just the sensations and images. You had an unconscious process. Now, if you've ever heard the term social desirability, um, Watt suggests that this was an unconscious set, right? A response set. We all want to seek approval of other people. We all want to be liked. So on an unconscious level, we tend to answer things in a way that is considered desirable to the person who's asking the question. So our responses aren't just what's happening in the moment, our behavior is shaped by other things. Our behavior is shaped by what we expect other people to, to think of us or uh, what the social norms are. This idea is not uncommon. I said to you with uh, the word association task, that is a, uh, subjective test. It's a projective test. So it does tap in to the unconscious as we will learn about from Freud. So even Freud did not have a monopoly on the concept of the unconscious. So if I were to pull back and try and, you know, look bird's eye view, well, what, what is it that you should know? you should know that psychology from its onset had divisions, from its onset had disagreements as to what the psychological science should look like. Another thing that uh, you will come to know is that Germany does not remain the center of psychology. If you remember how I described Wundt's lab, after the war, everything, including his laboratory, is bombed and destroyed. So German, that was symbolic, but uh, Germany did not remain the center for psychology. W where did the center of psychology become? The United States. Now, Wundt's primary student, and this is a bridge between today's lesson and the next lesson we're going to do, uh, Titchener. Titchener brought Wundt's ideas to the United States, but listen to how I say it. He brought his version of Wundt's psychology to the United States. If you were to have Wundt and Titchener explain structuralism, there would be some real differences. However, because Titchener translated Wundt's work from German to English, in that translation process, he smoothed out a lot of the differences between his work and Wundt's work. So that is really the rest of today's lesson.
Now I'm going to uh, stop the recording.